Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the September 6th uh, instance of the uh, Gamma, uh, Gateway API Gamma meeting. Uh, this meeting is governed by the Kubernetes uh, Code of Conduct, uh, which boils down to be nice to people. Um, if you need help with that, uh, it is on the Kubernetes org, uh, Kubernetes community uh, GitHub uh, repo. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screens. We've got a couple of agenda items today and some fun things to talk about, as always. Uh, like I mentioned, this is our uh, public agenda. I'll place a link to it here in the chat. Uh, feel free, please uh, add an agenda item or and, and make sure you add yourself to the attendees list uh, just for a record of your attendance and can see all the wonderful people who uh, like to talk about uh, Gateway API and service mesh things. The, um, the first uh, topic we have on our agenda is uh, kind of a transition and a bit of a confession on my part uh, for some administrative failures. Uh, so a while ago, I opened up this, uh, the, I made this document and opened up an issue for uh, this GET 1294 for mesh service binding. And uh, it, I, I meant for it to be kind of the second GET that we tackled after mesh representation. But after the last gamma meeting, uh, we kind of realized we, there, there's only so much we can do with mesh representation before we need to actually like have a vision for how we're going to bind services to routes and, and things of that nature the other way around. Um, and so we're we gonna start do, putting some effort into this mesh service binding uh, document. And so I started some, some lights um, stuff, uh, light work on this, and, uh, but then Mike Morris said that he, you know, he had some thoughts that he dumped in a second doc, which is specific to HTTP route mesh binding. And I started reading this doc um, and I was like, you know, this actually encompasses most of what I wanted to to discuss, and it has, I think, the added advantage of being concrete for folks to be able to reason about um, a particular route, HTTP route, instead of trying to start with a pattern for all the different X route resources. Um, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to start with, H, with HTTP route and then uh, iterate toward uh, a, a pattern that works for the other resources. Um, and it's easier to talk about because we're being uh, concrete. So kind of what I'm proposing is that we uh, essentially retire this doc and either move to this H route, HTTP route doc or copy it over so it's in one spot. Uh, but I want to get other folks' opinions on this. I uh, see uh, Flynn, you've got your hand raised. Uh, go ahead. So with respect to your documents, um, I think that switching over and working from that document is great. I have no opinion on whether that involves copying it into something with a different name or just changing references to it. Uh, with respect to the agenda, I was going to propose the times that we've gone through in other instances of this meeting to talk about particular gaps. We have managed to absorb all of the available time, and so I would kind of like to invert the order of things on this agenda and maybe talk a little bit first about working POC stuff so that that can hopefully inform discussion around the HTTP route binding stuff. I actually really, really like that. Um, I'm gonna, and I'd like to kind of do that moving forward for other meetings uh, to, to save get discussion for last uh, to make sure that other stuff can breathe. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, I think, Digging into the papers seems great, but it can be time consuming. Completely agree. Any other comments? Agree, disagree? Okay. Uh, so I'll take a note to do that. Um, and then uh, in that case, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Shane, uh, for your agenda item. I don't want to necessarily drive. I'm really hoping this just turns into a discussion. Um, but it's kind of a follow-up to something we talked about in, I want to say it was the last meeting. And so I'll kind of point it, I guess, I guess at you first, Keith, just like we, we kind of discussed or at least touched on the topic of starting to have a POC that's built as part of the GEP. How do you, how do you feel about that? Like where, where, does, where do you want to go with that? Do you want to go anywhere with that? Ooh, this is uh yeah we, we touched lightly on that last time um 
For me, I think that um, having POCs is a great idea that works well for things that are smaller and more contained. Or for something of the scale of what we're talking about with here, like having a working POC is going to involve like building out a whole thing. I mean, uh, John, you got your... your uh, yeah, Istio you <clears throat> already has one. So I agree if you're saying like <laughs> every time the proposal changes week to week, we want to update it. That's a the extreme but if we want some variant of something like we did already do this in Istio, um and you know we expect to change it obviously once we have something formalized here but uh, i guess my question is what are what specifically are we hoping to gain from a poc and i don't mean that like sarcastically i know the benefits to poc things are are numerous but is there a particular goal that you have in mind for uh, doing a POC as part of the GEP um, or as part of and where we insert that in the GEP process? Those are kind of my two primary questions. I guess pointed right at me. Um, so it occurs to me that we're this is big and that is part of why i feel like the poc might be helpful so for those of us who are going to be implementing this but are otherwise very busy having everything conceptual and in english descriptions of what we want to do is necessary ultimately uh, but it's possible that having a poc uh, could get us get us there faster. And if not faster, it might be fun. And that, that's just kind of where I'm at right now. Costin, I think you were next. No, you're next. OK. Uh, no, just quick. Uh, gamma POC involves a lot of stuff. I mean, involves low level networking, involves interception, IP table, a lot of stuff. I would rather see each implement vendor that is part of this group create their own implementation with their own infrastructure, because that really is a problem infrastructure, not the few APIs we're adding. How do you intercept? How do you use Sidecar or not Sidecar? And, uh, and then have you know some sync and try to sort out uh, what works commonly well or what is very difficult to implement on implementation. So we, we, we take it out of the, or, or we discuss it. Yeah, so I think, to, I'm assuming you're done. Um, yeah, so I think if so, I think POCs are nice, but I think the the thing that would also help Shane is probably us having. I was going to suggest something like um, separately that uh, we had some something like an agreed on set of like sort of slight, uh, slightly more deep dive like specific use cases that you want to be able to hit with um, with a mesh that binds a HTTP route to a service. Right, like something like, you know, hey, uh, for as a producer of a service, I want to be able to bind a HTTP route that um, that routes traffic for a certain path to two different to uh, in a weighted way to two different uh, to two different like Kubernetes service deployments, right? For for purposes of canary testing or something like that, right? Like sp very specific use cases that pro that almost every service mesh is going to do that 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 we say okay. Given this, given this um, uh, binding implementation, how would you do? What would the config look like? Um, you know, for for these like two or like two or three maybe use cases, um, very specific use cases. And I think the good thing there is that that gives us shame what you're talking about. That we have some sort of concrete thing that we're talking about. We're not just being like, uh, maybe it'll work like this. We're like, how does it work for these two specific things? And what does the config look like? Because I, I mean, personally, I found that a lot of the time it's when you start writing down the YAML for something that's when you're like, oh, that totally doesn't work. Or, you know, how does this work? Or, you know, this thing here is going to be really unclear. Maybe we should do things a little differently. Um, and, and that's that's opposed to the, that's sort of a work example rather than a POC with actual working code. I guess the thing that I was trying to say before is if, if it involves doing a whole bunch of actual implementation, then you know, it kind of depends on where the implementations are at and if they're ready to do that. Like, for Cilium Service Mesh, right? Like, you know, we don't even have any gateway API stuff implemented yet, so I can't, I can't do a, po a POC yet because I don't have the infrastructure yet. And there's like quite a bit of work to get there. 
So I'm not going to be able to be useful in that respect, but I can be useful in terms of doing work examples. I, uh, Flynn, you're next with, and I, I want to bring up that I think Flynn, you actually started some of this direction in the past with that HackMD article. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that one of the reasons that I like the idea of trying to do this with a focus on a POC, whether it is, you know, YAML stuff or whether it's code, gets all the way back to this idea of, yeah, let's pick some use cases and use it to narrow the scope that we're working on for the first release. And this has often gotten us into the question of what versus how, but, you know, I, I feel like we may have a little bit more consensus there in that it seems that people have this idea that, okay, we should be able to bind HTTP routes to some sorts of things. And then we, I think, can reasonably start asking questions like, all right, what kinds of things do we need to support? What will that look like? I think that's an, an entirely reasonable set of questions to be asking right now. Um, I would actually go so far as to say that for an initial stab at it, I think we should explicitly not have mesh objects and not have mesh class objects and see how far we get in the really simple case of Okay, suppose that your gateway and your service mesh are required to inter interact with the same set of HTTP routes. Where does that get us into trouble? Where does it get us into benefit? Things like that. Oh, and I'm happy to, to you know, revise the HackMD doc and or move it to some other format that we think would be more useful. You turn that into a question actually of, you know, is there a more useful place for things like that? That all makes sense to me and everybody had good thoughts. Um, I am trying not to throw too many, I'm not trying to throw wrenches in the gears, I'm trying to play a supportive role and like help where I feel like there might be a need. So I'm happy to kind of take this myself and be like, okay, everybody had some good thoughts and go take a look at the, uh, the Istio uh, uh, POC that I didn't know existed personally, um, but not to say that we shouldn't have further conversation about it, but I think that'd be for me a good next step. I think one of the pieces of feedback I had personally from the Hack and D document in the first time is that there, there, was, there hadn't been that consensus yet. Yeah. I, I, I think we, we were, everybody kind of had different directions we didn't have the shared vocabulary of the of the gap that we wrote and so um i'm a i think we're in a better position now to perhaps go back in that direction um for the but, record i think that that feedback was entirely fair yeah i mean that, that that's i mean that, that that's the big you know one of the, one of the problems we're trying to solve that's not technical at all it's 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 how do you start from right. nebulous requirements everybody in a different page and work together to come towards something that's somewhat common and agreed upon. Uh, and this is, this is difficult. This is what <laughs> is, is, is some of our time. So yeah. um, no, no, no worries there. Um, Does it make sense to try to get the HackMD stuff into one of the gaps as like a component of the gap? Probably, or probably some of it. Yeah, I, uh, Nick, go ahead before I go. Go ahead. Yeah, oh, I, I was going to say um, that, yeah, I was going to say something else, but yeah, to, to address that, I think, the, yeah, that one of the things that I was trying to say was, I think that in that, in the gap that we're going to review later, I think that doing the exercise of for each of these options, we're going to check, you know, these two use cases and putting it in that gap is a really good way to sort of compare and contrast the different, uh, the different mm -hmm. options in a concrete way rather than a more um, sort of conceptual way. Um, and I think the, um, uh, oh, I lost the other thing I was going to say, oh, it'll come back if it's important. Sounds like a couple of action items that we have then on this would be one, and this could kind of be for everybody, but I'll certainly do it. Go take a look at the Istio POC so far, which I just kind of clicked on the link and I doubt it's too, uh, like, it doesn't look like it's actually that deep, which is good. And then two. Um, if somebody could kind of start migrating some of the HackMD stuff and integrating it, I guess is the right word, with uh, the relevant gap. Yeah, I can take that one. Um, Keith, I'll probably ping you 
tomorrow about that. I'll ping you on Slack. Yeah, that sounds good. I've finally starting to have some, some have some more time free up. I've had a really busy last couple of weeks. And so I've got some more time to be able to, to focus towards this. Um, great. Uh, go ahead, Kostin. Uh, yeah, on the, on the Istio uh, POC, uh, you may notice the uh, mesh, you know, the attachment parent ref is not in ex ex exactly what we want it to be. And it's just a placeholder that we put to have something to attach. But uh, that's what we are hoping the, the gap will, will achieve, you know, any kind of standard attachment point either service or whatever mm -hmm. super service we decided before. Uh, as soon as it's defined, I think we'll be very happy to, to switch to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I, I think it's a good uh, starting point as well. Uh, one thing I'll say before uh, you, uh, Nick, is you know, I'm, it, it came to my mind when, when, when Shane, uh, can't remember what he said, but he said something. Um, that you know, a, a GEP is kind of the phone deliverable um, of what we of what we're doing here in Gamma. And uh, I, I just realized, noticed myself falling into this trap of, you know, we don't necessarily have to start with with gaps if that's not going to be the best way to go about figure answering the questions we need to get answered um doing the doing the work to, to prove things out um we may very well find that we don't have enough for a clear gap yet and we need to you know go to something else and then come back to it um so i'll say that go ahead nick oh yeah so i remember the two the things i was gonna say so um first one is yeah so i think when we go to the the, to the discussion of the current gap the document um i think like i feel like it would be really useful to to sort of kick that off with a let's sort of talk about a couple of the use cases that we can then use for examples that will then help flynn for when he's bringing his hack and do things in um and uh i think also the other thing is that i wanted to say is the um it's really important to remember that when we were doing the initial round of gateway api stuff um we took like many 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 times longer to do this right like if I understand that it can feel really slow and frustrating, but I promise you that this is much less slow and frustrating than it was when we were doing the initial gateway API one. Like, it's so much better. <laughs> and we appreciate your sacrifice with the initial gateway API work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that, if I, if I'm like, I think we should do this first. Usually, it's because uh, on the initial gateway API stuff, we had times when we would talk about things, and then I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. When we were doing that, the thing that helped us was having some concrete examples or you know, agreeing about this sort of stuff before we got to like, we, what we did before was we would argue about this for like three or four months. Uh, and then, uh, you know, then, then we would come back to maybe we should write down some concrete examples. Um, so yeah, uh, that's why I'm trying to be like, let's do those things now. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, do we have any last, uh, comments on this, um, Agenda item. We got some really good action items out of this, um, and I really appreciate you bringing this up, Shane. Any last topics of conversation before we move on to discussing the actual gap and uh, taking Nick's advice there? Okay. Um, one uh, kind of housekeeping note uh, <clears throat> is I've, I'm going to be switching over to the um, mesh binding doc, uh, so I'm not going to be able to take a really good notes in uh, in the meeting notes uh, agenda. So if somebody wants to volunteer to take some uh, meeting notes, then uh, I really appreciate that. Um, so anyway, uh, so what'd you say? Oh, did, did, did you just ask for somebody to take the notes while you continue? Yes. I'll do that. Oh, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there'll be suggestions, but I'll just accept them afterward. Um, OK, so yeah, this is the um, HTTP route mesh binding gap that uh, Mike created. Um, I like it. It's a lot more concrete than what I was originally going to do. Um, I don't see particular specific use cases. Um, but in lieu of that, I'm actually going to go to our, our original gap and see if we have any there. Um, let's see reference. Search producer. Okay, this isn't super specific, um, but it's it's probably it's, one of the most basic ones. Um, I think that's specific enough. Yeah, I agree. Um, 
But yeah, as a service producer, I, I wanted to deploy a canary version of my application that splits traffic based on HTTP properties. So as we're reading through this 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 gap uh, and talking through it, that's kind of, let's try to going to try to frame that as the the goal for for conversation is traffic splitting based on HTTP properties. So let me get the correct doc. All right. So um, I'm going to use the same both of the personas and uh, that, that that gateway API does, and we're binding things to services. Um, I'm going to skip goals for now uh, with the use case straight in mind, uh, fresh in mind. Let's talk, just talk through some of the approaches that are declared here. Um, this looks very similar to Istio's uh, implementation of Gateway API. Uh, uh, yeah, for uh, for binding with a a mesh resource, um, even though in Istio it's not technically a, a resource, it's just uh, a kind mesh. Um, and so what this would be is um, on each HTTP route, um, the parent ref would be uh, binding to a cluster scoped mesh object as defined in the mesh representation doc from uh, that we hashed out last week. Um, this could be mesh, this could be mesh class, the name is not important, but it's the cluster wide definition of the, of, of the mesh uh, that you are going to be binding to. And um, one of the to-dos here to figure out is uh, how does this work with uh, explicit host names or, uh, you know, because it's HTTP and as, as well as trying to balance the transparent proxy behavior for routing Kubernetes services um, defined as a backend ref. Um, there are some decisions to be made there uh, as far as priority and, and things of that nature. So uh, keep that in mind for this approach and likely every approach, honestly, as we're dealing with the HTTP route. Um, the, uh, the, the other, another approach is to, instead of binding to a cluster scoped mesh resource, uh, it would bind the, uh, the, the, the uh, HTTP rep would bind to a service uh, resource. And um, that service resource notably would be the same uh, as the backend ref. Uh, at least one of the backend refs for that HTTP route, uh, and this actually gives us our um, our traffic splitting uh, use case right here and uh, some sample YAML. Um, this uh, option would uh, is kind of dependent on the front end role of the Kubernetes service resource, as we've talked about at length. Um, the the front end back end duality of a Kubernetes service, um, and we're going to we use the uh, Kubernetes DNS name as the canonical address for which the traffic would be redirected by rules defined in the HTTP route. Um, so, yeah, so not using a host name specifically, but using the front end of this service resource um, as defined. Now, this, this gets interesting when you start thinking about uh, different trust domains, uh, I'm assuming that there's, there'd be a namespace uh, piece here as well, or if you do inherit this namespace. Um, but yeah, that's that's that option. We're just more thinking about that. Um, it goes on to uh, it goes on to discuss the example. It's, it's correct me if I'm wrong here, but when you are talking about the Kubernetes DNS name as the canonical address, et cetera, et cetera, I don't think you're implying using the Kubernetes DNS service to look things up necessarily. You could just as easily be using that as a key to find endpoint slices, for example, or things like that. Am I correct there, or am I just putting words in your mouth? So I so I didn't write this, uh, mm. but based on what it says, it does seem to imply using the. Well, let's let let's read here. Actually, routing was right. configured to redirect ninety percent of traffic to the foo. Okay, the backend endpoints specified by the service selector field. So this actually does seem to be using endpoints rather than the front end. So maybe this is, uh, yeah, that DNS piece doesn't seem to be used here at all. This definitely seems like the oh, okay. So for the transparent, I see what it's saying. So for the transparent proxying, you no, know, for the proxy to recognize requests and intercept them. Uh, it would be 
using the DNS name kind of as a matcher. Um, but then for actual like traffic routing to determine, you know, what hosts, what endpoints are being are having traffic forwarded to it on behalf of this service, we would use endpoints in the service selector. Um, so uh, that, that that should be reworded, but it does appear to, to be talking about both. This piece is talking about the transparent proxy forwarding, and then this piece is talking about the actual you know, which IP addresses, which endpoints belong to this service. Right. Take a pause and make sure I'm reading through the read through the chat. All right. So there's a, a duality, right? When you address services, and, and we need to choose which one we mean. Is a Kubernetes service generates both a VIP and a DNS name. Both are generated. Uh, you could choose to do a host name match in HTTP routing based on the DNS name alone, regardless of what the IP was. Right, which could be really dangerous to do, by the way. Um, but maybe that's what you meant to do, right? As a service producer, you couldn't do that for any IP other than the IPs that you owned. Sorry, are you right. talking about you can do that hostname match when you're trying to pick an endpoint to which to route, or are you talking about a hostname match where you're looking at the HTTP request and looking at the hostname that it originally requested, or are you talking? Right, about we, 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 you have to be clear about which yes. of those two. Um, and we also have to clear, be clear about who's doing the routing when we make that choice. Yep. If the routing was occurring in something that I, the producer, owned, it would probably be okay to do either. If the routing was occurring in something that I didn't own, like a client sidecar, routing on the host name alone, right, regardless of IP match, is a risky thing to do. Right? It would be like me. Like a, a worse example of that would be producer writing a host matching rule for star as the host name and capturing all HTTP traffic for everybody, right? And that would be bad. Right, so we have to be quite precise about what we mean here. And it, it has an implication on context of execution. Yep. I think that there's one other thing here and that host name is a really nice uh, abstraction to use for HTTP route. But like when we do need to then extend to TCP route or UDP route, it's going to get weird. Whereas IP is available on all of those options. No, but a uh, host name is actually mapped on IP. I think. Yeah, I know, I know. So yeah. like, and I, I don't disagree, Cosmo. I'm agreeing with you. Like the um, yeah. the point I'm trying to make. Is, sorry, go IP, ahead, Nick. Uh, IP is always available. Um, and as Costin says. The host name is really, you're using the host name really as a lookup for the uh, a lookup where you don't need to worry about details uh, of like, has the IP changed or something like that. Um, the, um, it does feel like the, this is, this is a case where we need to talk, like where we kind of need to talk about like, okay, I'm, I'm going to get conceptual here. Sorry. But like, <laughs> what is service? like what is a service, right? Like, what is the service that we are talking about binding things to? What is its identity? Like, what's the one thing that identifies that service as opposed to some other service, right? Like in terms of the user experience, it's the name, right? Like it's a name, it's a, it's a what are you? But in terms of the, the actual identity of the service from a traffic routing point of view, it is an IP. Like an IP or set of IPs, like usually a, a VIP is gonna be, again, itself a representation of a set of endpoints. You know, and it's it's a way to have a stable IP address that that manages a non-stable pool of endpoints, um, and so the, you know, like, yeah. So I, I think that um, the you know thinking saying like a service's identity is it's uh, you know is at sort of the most fundamental level it's VIP, and then we can build additional identity constructs on top of that, but having that be sort of the disambiguating key is like the the important thing that we need to talk about here. And this comes down to like, what is the front end of the service? And the front end of the service is then in this, in this sort of what I'm talking about here, the front end of the service at its heart is a VIP. Yeah, uh, I, I completely, well, yeah, I, I, I agree for the most part. I, I do want to make sure that we're not, um, that we're not forgetting the variety of use cases where host name is is very important um 
Th- so they I have additional things I was going to say on that, but I didn't want to go too far into it. So like, <laughs> there's more complexity there than what I just said. But sorry, interrupted you. No, no, you're good. I, 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 and I'm sure I'm sure you're aware of this, but like you know, there there are a lot of of constructs where it, you know the HTTP the host name is being used as a um, you know, a way to front multiple internal services. Uh, the, the Java world is is very accustomed to to things like that. Um, GRPC, GRPC is huge uh, for host name. So, for for me, when I think about this mentally, and everybody's kind of got a, a, a slightly different abstraction based on what the domain they're working in requires. But from when I, when I think about you know the identity of a service, I I struggle to think about it as any more decomposed than a compound primary key between host and HTTP specifically. But I, I think I have to think about it as like a compound primary key between IP, really like IP membership within a higher level VIP, um, but IP plus host name. Um, and I, I I feel like I've I think we've talked about this in the other in the main gateway API meeting, but it, it feels like there's a um, kind of a, a series of, of matchers um, where it's IP first, then host name, uh, but both must be set, um, or are both must match rather. And I I think anything less than that, you either lose a lot of the um of the advantages and, and a lot of the um use cases for http um in the host name case and the others is like pure host name as louis mentioned earlier is is very very dangerous um so i feel like you've got to have both um when you turn when it comes to like service identity uh, i think it was flynn than nick i wanted to and, you know, Kostin said this in the chat, actually. Um, I wanted to point out that no matter what we decide we think a service identity really is, to a user, the host name, the name that goes with the service is the only thing they're going to be thinking about. And so in a very real sense, we have to recognize the fact that the end users of the thing will be thinking of services as named with their names. Um, In a lot of ways, I think that that kind of, you know, we've we've talked about the fact that service is a horribly overloaded term. And I think that another part of this one is like, yeah, you know, host names mean different things to different people at different contexts. And we're going to have to be very clear about what exactly a thing that looks like a DNS fully qualified domain name, what does that really represent and how? Um, yeah, yeah, Keith, don't, don't, dude. Um, but uh, the other thing I was going to say also was, it's interesting to me to hear people say things like, really, the identity is the VIP, because, um, I don't know, in my world, the identity is really a cryptographic key, not so much the IP address anyway. But uh, yeah, in terms of routing traffic to the thing, the thing that you route to has to be an IP address. I absolutely accept that. And I think that that's an important thing to bear in mind. We have to deal with the fact that the users are going to think in terms of names. We also have to think about the fact that to get traffic to the pod, we have to deal with IP addresses. Okay. So yeah, to, to go back to what I was saying, the um, I, I left it sort of on a deliberately provocative statement on purpose, but like they, I think uh, it's the part that's really important here is like, yes, the, the actual identity of the service is going to be some composite of a number of things about the service, right? Like IP, the host name, like the Kubit, like some sort of Kubernetes object name. But I think it's pretty reasonable that people might want to be able to define, you know, rules in terms of like some Kubernetes resource, right? like a Kubernetes service, for example. But like, and, and then there's also, you know, some sort of cryptographic identity or something like that is probably going to be important at some point. I know we've said before that we don't want to mandate that we talk about the MTLS like as part of this description because that's implementation did help with the mesh, which I agree with. But as Costin said in the chat, like, you know, there, you, there are going to be stuff that's like, you know, certs to connect to the service and some stuff like that that's bound to the service. That is literally what I'm talking about when I talk about the backend properties in the, that other gap. Right, like 
there is a set of properties that are sort of tightly bound to the, the actual pods that are running that, that you know, that, that are pretty tightly bound to that. And so the service identity is going to span all of those things. But the point that I was trying to make is at the end of the day, the thing that this API is all about is actually getting traffic to pods. And so at its lowest level is probably a better way to say this. The service identity is the VIP of some, is, is a single IP that is like a representation of a set of IPs, right? Like you can talk about it as a set of IPs or a single IP, but like the, you, and so it, you, it, we could say it's a set of IPs and that that then means, oh, you don't have to have VIPs. But like the, um, I think the, um, you, it's probably better to, to try and make it so that almost every implementation I can think of is going to end up having a single IP as like a, as a proxy for some, for the set of the actual IP, pod IPs. Costin, over to you. Uh, yeah, to, sorry to disappoint you. Uh, you see, someone mentioned gRPC. Uh, we have this proxyless gRPC support where there is no VIP involved at all because proxyless gRPC and any kind of native implementation of the mesh uh, is, you know, dialing a particular service with host name and there is no, no resolution of uh, to VIP in this case. We only need the VIP if we need to go to IP table or some interception mechanism. Otherwise, if it's native, the host name directly can be mapped to, you know, mesh APIs and then uh, uh, load balancing decisions. Um, so in that case, in that case, does the is the uh, the host name mapped to like a set of actual endpoint addresses? Uh, in the internal implementation, we'll talk with Kubernetes via whatever, via XDS or whatever, and get uh, load assignments to where it should send the traffic, I mean, the actual destination. Which can be, you know, real endpoints, can be in a different class, can be anywhere, but that, there, is, there is no cluster VIP involved. And when I said a set of VIPs, I meant multi-cluster use cases where you have, you know, Kubernetes assign you a VIP, but because you're multi-cluster, you may have a set of such VIPs that each of them represents the same service. So it's it's not really I didn't mean actual endpoints. So but but like it's still reasonable to describe that set of endpoints like by by a pseudo IP of some sort, right? Like, you know, even if you're not actually routing traffic to it, then like you need to be able to have some bucket that you put those endpoints in. And like in that in the case of the specific UK you're talking about, it's a specific gRPC hostname. But like hostname is like is pretty much always like a, a like a I don't want to use the word proxy, but like a, a stand-in for uh, for like an IP address, right? Like to, to, at, at some level. Yeah, but we, we are talking about two different kinds of IP addresses. We are talking about VIPs, which are basically some synthetic like cluster IP in Kubernetes. And we are talking actual destination IPs. And when we're talking destination IPs, we are talking really about nodal assignments where, you know, just you send me three endpoints where I send the traffic, but doesn't mean that it's the same. Uh, so we need to make a distinction between endpoint IPs and, and, and service IPs, I think. Yeah, okay, but but the but making that decision in distinction doesn't help us to talk about what is the service's identity. But like yeah, the, the thing that I'm trying to get here is like, what's the thing that that tells you that service foo is different from service bar? Right? Like what are the things that tell you that service foo is different from service bar, right? Like I suspect the name and the certificates are the main things we have. Not probably. See, not, not everybody has a certificate to disambiguate it, right? Like. No, no, yeah. I know, but but then it's a name. So if you don't certificate, then it's a name. Like, but the, that's what I'm saying. Like, uh, what I'm trying to do is to break the service identity down into the one thing that everybody is going to have to support, no matter what features you have available in your mesh, and that is an IP, right? Maybe a set of IPs, right? Like being the endpoint addresses, but like having it stand in as an IP is like, that's the one thing that everybody's gonna to have to agree on because everybody is doing IP routing, but like nobody's suggesting that we're gonna do, you know, uh, you know, mesh routing via IPX, right? Like, you know, or something like that, right? So like that, that what I'm trying to say is like, we've got to break this down to the most fundamental things that are not like the, the things that only some implementations are gonna support. Like what is the core support? What is the core thing that everybody has to do? Right, like that's that's the question I'm trying to ask you. So, I, another way to phrase what I, you just said, Nick, is we're specifically focused on the routing problem at this point. I mean, it, identity, identity service identity is a very loaded term, especially in in mesh world. Um, but when it comes to allowing some network 
some network device to make a routing decision. You, by, for, for just by every implementation we're talking about, there's got to be something with which we can refer to a destination. And at L4, you know, that's an IP. Just pure and simple. Yeah, I, I think it's... I think it's important to to call out the distinction between an identity and a routing destination because no matter what you decide to use to identify the service, yes, you're going to end up at layer four with an IP address. Right, um, and, and the thing is, you know, the, the, the other the other side okay. of that. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, I was just gonna. We could argue about whether we're talking about layer three or layer layer four, whatever. Yeah. True. Um, but um, yeah, the other, the big thing with mesh though is that you're able to to use L7 context for this routing for these routing conversations. Right. That, that that's one of I think the non-negotiables for anything that's going to talk about service mesh use cases. Like you, you've got to be able to elevate to L7 and use that context for routing decisions. So at the same, so so while yes, at the end of the day, a, a routing destination is going to be a IP. I don't think you can ignore host name um, as well. So like we, we've kind of been talking around this for a second. I think we're getting close to like circling the drain here. <laughs> it, 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 it sounds like there's general consensus that we need both. And we're, at this point, we're trying to figure out how to represent that. Is, is, that, is that fair? Um, we started talking, we started on this, talking about this particular um, binding approach where it's referencing a service kind. I've, I've got other issues with this and um, let me show you. Uh, Lee Wynn had some uh, uh, some good comments in the chat about this as well. Um, it, it, it sounds like we all know we need to find something to represent both in in, in, in the API somehow. Does, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. I'm not sure I agree. Uh, is that in most, I mean, maybe in some cases we need to represent IP for sure, but I think in most cases users will not need to put in their CRDs in their configs IPs. I am not, I am not for a moment suggesting that users will be putting in the, the IP as, as, as a key, right? Like what I am saying is that the constructs that implementers will need to do use IP as a key, right? Like, because the problem is if you are saying everything is going to be a host name, what host name is that? Is that the short host name that is just the service name? Is it the one that's dot, serv dot namespace dot service dot cluster dot local? Like John called out earlier that bringing dot cluster dot local then in as a defined part of the API then means that if you change that, you're 100% screwed, right? Like if we say it has to be the host name, then the problem is that you are stuck defining which host names are the canonical host names. No, Nick, I think we're on the same page. I mean, if you are saying that users will never put IPs in the YAML, I think we're on the same page. Internally, we do whatever we do. It's not, you know, everyone can do whatever they feel necessary. Proxy gRPC may not use IP, other will use IPs. But uh, what we need to agree and have consensus is that users will not type IPs in YAMLs unless they really mean it. I mean, if they have a very special case. That, uh, okay. Yeah, I that's, yeah, that's absolutely what I was saying. But what I was trying, the point I was trying to get to is like, if users are if users are putting a, a domain name in their YAML, then how do you how do you pick like how do you disambiguate those domain names if the same domain name is used in two different places? And the answer that I'm trying to say is that's the IP. That this is like this is about how do you break down the you know, what happens when you have conflicts? What happen, How do you do conflict resolution? What is the fundamental unit that you're going to use to resolve conflicts? Not yeah, sorry to disappoint you. Uh, you know, the overlapping IPs are a problem. I mean, your <laughs> IP is not sufficient. It's network plus IP because we have support for the overlapping network. Sure. I mean, we, unless we have moved to IPv6, where we have to think that way. But... Sure. Okay. But like, you know, again, I, I understand that there are a million edge cases that are going to screw things up, right? Like, definitely. But the whole thing that I'm trying to say is because there are a million, million edge cases that are going to screw things up we need to all agree on like what are the disambiguation things right like what are the disambiguate what is the front end of the service right like oh, we yeah. have to agree on that if we can't agree on what the front end of the service is then we are never going to be able to write an api because we all have different ideas about what a service is but like the you like you can't write an api when people have different have different um 
you know, the, because the API will end up ambiguous if you have different ideas about what the what some fundamental concept is, right? And the front end of the service thing that the thing that the the, the rules target, right, is the is the thing that we need to agree on, right? And so the binding the, the reason this is relevant to the binding discussion is that if you can't agree on what the front end of the service is and what because then you're never going to be able to agree on how to bind the services because the ser the services must bind to something that ends up as at the front end of the service. That's what I, that's why I, that's why I introduced this topic of discussion, right? Like so that that's all I'm trying to say is that you know, I I think I, I have dis I derailed this conversation and I'm sorry um you know but like I think that there's a, this is sort of the fundamental thing that that is important to understand as we talk about these different options is that at its heart, you need to understand like, what is the service that you are binding to, right? Like, you're like, is the service that you are binding to the, 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 the object that you use to talk about it? Or is it the, some other sort of more conceptual thing? Well, I think we agree, uh, Nick. We are not uh, completely <laughs> in this range. I mean, I think we just need to be a bit flexible because, you know, process strategy in other cases, we may not actually expose an IP, but that's probably implementation specific and we don't have to worry about it. But I agree with you that the conceptual level is that you have a, a, a service name that will have a bit, except exceptions. <laughs> yeah, yes. And so I guess that's what I was trying to say. I did not, I wasn't, I, I apologize for not being clear enough that I was talking at the conceptual level, not at the, like implementation level, like the so, but that's that's what I'm trying to get at is that like we need to have some agreement on like what's the service, what is a service, right? Like, and that's that we tried to talk about that before, and we ended up with this decision between front end and back end. But in this case, we're talking about you know the front end, right? And we kind of the back end is obviously the pool of endpoints that you talk to plus some metadata about them, right? But the front end is still a bit woolly, and that's what I think we're trying. We need to really, it's really important we talk about as part of this discussion. So again, I'm sorry for derailing the conversation a little bit, but I think that sometimes you've got to go underneath underneath the discussion to make the discussion clearer. That's what I was trying to do. Is the phrase a little bit woolly? Does that have to do with like you can't see how a sheep looks until you shape them? Um, it wasn't intended to be, but uh, yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> Just curious. I never really heard the phrase before, but then that's what I thought of immediately. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail. I mean, yeah, I, I would have, I, I'm kind of meant it as it's a bit woolly in that you can squish it in and out and the boundaries are slightly undefined. I'm not sure that's any better than the sheep thing, Nick. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know. Growing up in the country in Australia, like, sometimes I don't know that my isms are uh, Australianisms. I, I was just curious, really. So what are we... What are we doing next here? Are yeah. we going asynchronous to decide on how to identify a service and what it is? Because we are yes. running on eight minutes. I mean, I would suggest if you if you look at that parent ref kind service name foo, then I don't know. Is that unambiguous is that ambiguous to people on the call or does that have a meaning that makes sense to us as humans even though there may be different you know implementations may need to do different things to to cause that reference to be in effect did that question make any sense yes. are you just saying why not use the service namespace name well, I mean, to me, I look at that and I go, okay, so that says that we're talking about a service resource. Its name is foo. I can assume that it is in the namespace in which that resource I'm looking at exists because I didn't override the namespace. Do other people have a similar feeling? Does this is exactly sense? what's been going on in my head, like the whole conversation. Yeah. So yeah, Personally. does does that concept make sense to people? I'm... Yeah. Uh, but I, I'll just briefly say that this is kind of what I was thinking about in in chat. Um, where in my, in my head, I was doing a lot of conflating between host name and front end because those are two separate jobs that are happening. Yep. One is a disambiguator for, like for, or one is a field in uh, HTTP routing, and and one is something that the user is referencing, and those aren't synonymous. Um, yeah. I, most, I, I think a question we need to answer is what does an implementation need to do with this parent ref? Uh, 
um, versus this back end ref. Because like, what, what are we trying to signify? Um, because and it's a little different with mesh because you are um, kind of, you're talking with two, two internal services. So what's the role of parent ref in that reality, I think, is something we need to answer. Um, go ahead, Nick. So, um, I kind of agree a little bit with what Lewin said in the chat that having the same thing be a parent ref and a backend ref feels oddly circular to me. I, I think I hadn't been able to put it in those words. I think, thank you, Lewin, for right at putting it in those words. That, that's, that has made me uncomfortable the whole time. Like, but the, the circularity of having the same thing be like the parent of the tree and the and a leaf of the tree is really weird to me. I know at a conceptual level that, that it's that we're talking about like the front end versus the back end. And those are two kind of distinct things. But that's what right. I, I think I've said before. I feel like if they're two distinct things, then they should be two distinct things. Right? Like there shouldn't be one thing representing two. That's caused me problems with the gateway API and SMI and yeah. This is, I think, loosely related. No, maybe not loosely. This is somewhat related to a problem we already have in Gateway API and that I've experienced firsthand in that um, we don't actually, we define the, the service as like the reference, but we don't define how that actually affects the routing, which I think is partially what we're getting into here. Like once you define the identity of a thing, if you would define it at the level of namespace name service, what does the routing look like and how do we prescribe that? Is, we're getting into that kind of subject, right? And um, we don't actually have, that's not, that is ambiguous in Gateway at the moment. Uh, so much though in our implementation, we actually have two ways of doing it where you use an annotation to decide whether you use the front end or the back end as we've, we've called it out in these docs. This is a problem I think that needs a little bit more definition, not just for mesh, but in general in Gateway API. I agree. Yeah. yeah. I, and I think that to your point, um, and Nick's and Lee wins like the, the, the service parent ref is seem definitely seems to be fulfilling the front end role here, um, is, is what seems to be implied, but then to see that same service reference as a back end is, is strange. And we need to be clearer on what roles is service fulfilling in any given usage. Um, now, the fact that one of them appears in a parent ref and one of them appears in a back end ref at least gives us a place to stand to talk about them fulfilling two different roles, right? So it's not as terrible as it could have been. Uh, it is a bit terrible because foo v2 can also be attached to an HTTP route and then it may forward to service foo and then it kind of gets uh, messy. So yes, we need to put some restrictions of how deep it can go. I mean, if the service yes. who is part of a backend ref, it means that it's a backend ref and we are only referring it as a collection of uh, endpoints and it's not a front end that will be routed. If we can make this thing clear to the user, I think we are good. So I think the, yeah, I think it, it has, it has some uh, isomorphism to like the, the delegation of HTTP routes, right? Like which we talked about in uh, the main gateway I think like you know in that you know, how do you stop there from being like an arbitrary nested number of things and then because if you have an arbitrarily nested number of nodes and they're, they're forming a graph then having cycles in that graph of config can be very bad yep. um you know like yeah and so um that's that's kind of what Cosmo is alluding here to if the if you have a, a, a another route attached to the service foo v2 in that example and that route then references service v1 what happens right like you know and, and there's there's no easy way to break that loop um and so the um yeah like the um <clears throat> and i think yeah that lewin has pointed out that the personas the personas are are tricky the um and i think that that's a really good thing that uh, that i actually had on my mental list of things to talk about and it had slipped out that the personas can really help us focus in here um, about like who owns the config and then that tells you where it should live right like the you know if you think about who owns the the config of the mesh versus who owns the config of the the front end of the service 
then that's a good way to break up like where those things should live and what resources they should be. But like, I think we've met, we had a few mentions here to like what happens if you have this reference across uh, namespaces. I think it is absolutely key that a lot of this stuff does not allow cross namespace references. It has to live in the same, it, you know, for, for a lot of the mesh resources is gonna be critical that in general, they live in the same resource as the thing that they're referencing. Um, you can't have the flexibility that you do in the, the Mango API to sort of refer to a backend across namespaces because it is a ticket to like crazy amounts of stuff about who owns what. Um, and that's that comes back to the, you know, who owns the config and who and who should be responsible for the different parts of the config. So I think, yeah, Lewin, as always, you've done a really great job of taking something that I thought in a really nebulous way and making it concrete. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Playing really quick because we're here at time. Um, part of way early on what I was saying. So, you know, I would actually propose that we start by saying we don't have a mesh resource. We don't have a mesh class resource. See how much trouble we get into. Some of that has to do with that difference in personas that we were talking about. It enables us to focus on one persona and really zero in on that and play with it for a bit. And especially because I don't think it's very difficult for me personally to see a strong use case for mesh and mesh, mesh class until we are talking about a world in which you can run multiple meshes in a cluster, which is a non-goal right this second or a deferred goal right this second. Um, focusing in on the persona of the developer who is likely to be the one using the HTTP routes makes a lot of sense to me. So I don't disagree, but in my mind, the the, the, the split of the personas that makes the most sense to me is that the uh, cluster administrator owns the mesh, even if there's only one in the mesh. And so the cluster, the cluster administrator is a different person a lot of the time to the application developer. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. having a separate resource, i.e. the mesh, I, I, I am ambiguous as to whether or not we have a mesh class, the, 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 re, the single resource is the mesh class or the mesh, but like that having a resource that is the thing that you associate routes to, <clears throat> it means that you have a really clear split between the thing that is owned by the mesh by the, by the cluster operator and the thing that is owned by application developer. And that's one of the reasons I tend to favor those things. I'm not saying we should sort of settle that now. I just wanted to have yeah. said that, that the, the person, that's the way the person is. We could have a much longer conversation about that, but let's do it asynchronously or something. Yes, I love async. Uh, gonna have to cut things off there as we're a couple minutes over time, but really appreciate it, everybody. Um, I, it sounds like to me, the action items here um, for folks to discuss asynchronously um, and, and, and to just be thinking about is uh, to, to dig into the personas and think about parent ref and in the context of service binding and what the persona split is and what are the implications of one on the other. Um, we've got a couple, you know, several different approaches here, uh, some with a cluster scoped mesh resource, some with a uh, service resource, some with a service binding resource. Uh, that we didn't get to, um, and the, even what's the persona for that service binding resource is not ex is, is immediately clear even. Um, so there's a lot of this good stuff to, to dig into. Um, I, I'm going to leave this document as is, and I would love to chat with folks in Slack, um, on GitHub discussions, or, or wherever, in, in, in comments here on the doc, and just Let's throw a lot of questions at this and see and see where these break where these break down. Um, had a lot of good discussion today over just one of these, so let's keep that going. Um, the next meeting will be on uh, September thirteenth at uh, eight a.m. Pacific time. Looking forward to seeing those of you who can make it then. Uh, but we're done. Thanks, everybody. Thank Cheers. You.